is to the syntax you want to use is to have model followed by the name you want to give to your model. So this, this will create what is called a model object. And uh, uh, then you can do a number of things on the model. And the first things you want to do is to uh, add identities. And this is achieved by having the model name. Now it use, uses the dot instead of the dollar to do operation on an object. So uh, append name of the model dot append will add an equation. Uh, if I add this, uh, sorry, let me close my email. Otherwise it's gonna bother us. Uh, if you add this at identity, uh, you are telling Evius that this uh, equation should not have any residual. And this is uh, relevant for something we will discuss later on add factors. So here I've included the identities we have from the national accounts to begin with. So these are the GDP identity, where PX is private expenditure, GT is government consumption plus investment, and XGS and uh, MGS are exports and imports. Uh, I'm using a K at the end of the variable name to denote a variable measure that constant prices. Uh, and uh, PGDP will be the GDP deflator. Uh, so what we will have here is that uh, each component of demand will be determined following the standard Keynesian approach uh, by some either behavioral assumption or for government expenditure, we will keep it uh, exogenous as well as for exports. Uh, each component will at current prices will be determined by multiplying the variable at constant price to its deflator. And uh, GDP at current prices will be the uh, sum of the components at current prices. So this implies that any error in uh, estimating the components of GDP will be uh, transferred to our error in measuring current price GDP and also on uh, the GDP deflator. So the GDP deflator becomes a variable which will sum up all the errors we make in the estimation. So it's a variable you want to check to see how far we are from fitting the data well. So these are everything which is already explained. GVA is gross value added. So here we subtract net indirect taxes to get Income, YD is the disposable income of the private sector, where we add uh, all the components we have identified in the transaction matrix. So this will be the interest received on government bonds. Uh, these are the dividends the private sector pays to the government and the foreign sector. These are the interest obtained from abroad. This is the rent paid to the government on land, these are social contributions paid to the government. These are pension payments and other transfers received from the government. And these are direct taxes paid to the government. And these are the residual items. Now, the other thing you want to do uh, is to uh, check uh, what are you missing from the model. Now, I told you yesterday that we are not considering all the transfers that uh, occur um, across sectors. And uh, what we don't consider ends up in this TRN, which are net other transfers. So you want to look at this TRNP over, let's say, GDP to have a measure of how much uh, we are not 
including explicitly into the model and whether these other net transfers have some peculiar features. So some, something like uh, increasing or decreasing trend. So this result is not so bad. It's saying that this uh, is a negative share of GDP of about 5%. And it seems to be fluctuating uh, seasonally but without any specific trend. So it looks okay to leave this variable as an exogenous unexplained uh, set of transfers. If this were a growing share of disposable income of the private sector, then uh, it would have been important to try to understand what uh, exactly was happening. Uh, the other thing we can do now is uh, we have finished with the, the accounting identities coming from the transaction matrix. So uh, we want to uh, endogenize what we can. And uh, uh, first of all, let me show you something that we will also show on uh, our, a little later. So I'm going to run these first lines. And uh, this has created this object with a little blue uh, symbol. And if I double click on this object, I have a list of the equations uh, that I've included in uh, an implicit format. Now, there are a number of interesting things I can do with the this model object before I go to simulation. And uh, uh, the first one is to have the variables and the variables, the view of the variables will uh, have in yellow variables which are not endogenous, do not have an equation to explain them. And in blue, the variables that I already identified with an equation time that I endogenized. So at this stage, you uh, want to check uh, whether you want to endogenize these yellow variables and how you want to do that. Now, I uh, had this in my slide. Uh, what uh, is usually convenient is uh, uh, to use ratios for any variables for which we don't think we need uh, an econ econometric estimate. So tax payments are usually a share of the tax base. So we simply compute uh, an ex post implicit tax rate for direct taxes, net indirect taxes, and social contributions. Also interest payments on, uh, an as, uh, on an asset will be uh, an average in the real world. They're an average of the interest that uh, you get uh, from, let's say, bonds at different maturities. So you have a, a whole range of interest rates. Uh, you if you want to do things very carefully, you want to have the different maturities, you want to have the share of different maturities in the total, but uh, you can simply uh, compute an average ex post interest rate, and this is what I've done here. So for the uh, taxes, I've computed this tau NIT, uh, for the direct taxes at tau DT, for the social contribution at tau SC, and for the interest payments, I've computed this RB uh, and uh, used this to uh, endogenize the flows of payments made on each, uh, uh, on both government bonds and foreign assets. And uh, I also computed this uh, uh, rate of return on equities and as I, as, as I told you yesterday, uh, I used two different returns because when you look at them, 
uh, they are very different. So the blue one is uh, what the government gets on its equities and uh, it's basically zero for most of the periods, while what the foreign sector is getting looks more like uh, an interest rate. Now this should be multiplied by four to be um, compared to a, a standard interest rate. And I forgot to do that, but it's okay. It's just a matter of scaling. And this is because as I told you, EG is a stock, DFG is a quarterly flow. So I should multiply uh, DFG by four to get a value for R R O E G to be compared to a, an annual uh, rate of return. It doesn't really matter that much. Uh, and uh, also, as I told you, the net transfers, uh, net other transfers from the, the sectors should uh, be zero when the, I go to sum them up. And this implies that I can uh, endogenize one of them arbitrarily, and it must be the, um, it must be such uh, that when summed up to the others gives me zero. Then, uh, as I also told you yesterday, uh, I have all these deflators, uh, specifically a deflator for government expenditure, exports and imports. And it's sometimes easier to model them in relation to the price uh, of consumption, or in our case, to the price of domestic demand, PPX. So I've computed these relative prices, and uh, we will have the relative prices as endogenous, as exogenous variables to be explained. This is also identities from the transaction matrix for the net lending. And finally, the uh, accumulation of net lending into the stocks of net financial assets for the whole sector. So uh, when we, I think we are finished with the identities. So I've run the program again and uh, we can now look at the model object. Now we have 31 equations, which are all identities. And uh, we can check which variables still need to be determined. So what is still in yellow are the stocks of assets. So the public debt held by the private sector that held by the rest of the world the equity held by the government and the rest of the world, the foreign assets held by the government and the private sector. GT is government expenditure, and this will be a fiscal policy uh, instrument, so it will, be, it will remain exogenous. Uh, imports need to be endogenized by some estimation because they will depend obviously on uh, domestic demand. Pension payments are usually another fiscal policy variable that can be left exogenous. PPX is our price index. And if we want to model inflation, we will need to estimate uh, an equation for this variable. Uh, PXK is the uh, domestic demand, and this will be the core variable in the model. And we will need to estimate it in a stock flow consistent way. Uh, rent is another policy variable. RB, RF, ROEG, and ROEW are, are rates of return. And for the time being, we can keep them exogenous. And maybe later we will link them to a re reference interest rate. RPG, RPMGS, and RPXGS are, are relative prices. And we will decide later whether we want to endogenize them or not. The TAUs are our tax rates and they are uh, fiscal policy variables. TRNG and TRNP are our residuals, so these will be variables we don't know 
how to explain and will be left exogenous. And this is why we wanted to check whether they were, they were uh, trending or not. And finally, we have exports, which are determined by the foreign demand. So it can be left exogenous, or we can try to explain them with additional variables. So uh, here uh, we have to, yes. How many variables can you leave as exogenous, and how many can you exogenize? Uh, well, yeah, this is what I, I sum, summarize this. Usually, uh, you want to have as endogenous everything which depends on model solutions. Okay, so let's say if pensions are indexed to wages and wages are explained by the model, then you want to link the pension payments to the wage with the sum equation, and you cannot leave them as exogenous. If the pension are decided by the government, then you can leave them exogenous. Uh, the point is the more you equations you endogenize, more variables you endogenize, with econometric estimates, the more errors you put into the model. Okay, so this is, uh, you're explaining more, but with a larger error component that you want to keep as small as possible. So we need to have some theory of uh, uh, financial variables, how, uh, the private sector demands bonds or foreign assets, how uh, the private sector supplies equities, and uh, we may want to have a theory for prices. Uh, but before we go to that, uh, what you want to do is to check that um, the model works for the accounting structure. So you want to simulate the model and uh, make sure that everything is fine. Now, I think I did this in the next program. Yeah, but I did it after. <clears throat> uh, so what you uh, can do in eViews I will now put in a, another file. So the procedure I normally use is I want a list of my endogenous and exogenous variables in the model. So in eViews, I get this with uh, uh, this MEX that I think I didn't, oh, yeah, here, here it is. So MSFC endog list is the list of endogenized variables. Exog list is the list of exogenous variables. Then I specify the solution period and in the solution period, you must have uh, values for all the exogenous variables and the lag endogenous variables. I solve the model. And when I solve the model, uh, I uh, eViews is creating uh, variables uh, for each endogenous, adding an underscore zero to the end. So the underscore zero is uh, associated to what we call the baseline solution of the model. And therefore I can look at GDPK against GDPK zero, and I want them to be exactly identical because they are linked by, I mean, now I don't have any estimate, I only have accounting identities. So if they're not exactly identical, there's uh, some mistake in my accounting somewhere. 
Now I've checked the accounting of this model and solved a couple of problems. So now the hard part is done, but this is where you usually have some trouble and uh, you want to know how to investigate the problem and see where it is. So what I do uh, is uh, since you want to check all of the variables, okay, you cannot just check one or two. Uh, what I do in EViews is to have a loop. And this is one of the things we discussed also yesterday on how to implement it in R. So in my loop, I take all the, the list of endogenous variable called MEND and uh, I create a comment uh, which basically is uh, uh, taking the name of the endogenous variable minus the name of the endogenous variable with the underscore zero, so the simulated, and it will show me uh, a group uh, where is my syntax server? No, the problem is that uh, these uh, percent mend are temporary variables. So I need to run all of this code in order to have them as uh, something meaningful. So when I do this, Evius creates a group that is called a group object. And uh, as you can see in uh, each column, I have one endogenous variable less its simulated value. And I can check whether these are all zeros. Now, uh, for instance, this is not zero, but this GTK has values which are in the range of the hundred of thousands. So a residual of minus zero, zero, 001 is basically zero. I can just ignore it. But you want to make sure that everything works at this stage. These are divided by a billion. So all the model is clear. Uh, there's, there are no accounting mistakes and we can continue our work. The other thing that uh, we may want to check are the hidden equations. So the hidden equation imply that NAFA P uh, yeah, the net lending of the private sector plus the net lending of the government plus the net lending of the foreign sector should be zero. And in the simulation, this is respected. And also the net wealth of these three sectors when summed up should be zero. And this is also respected by the model. So let's see how we do this in R. Okay, so uh, here we should have all the variables <clears throat> in this file called Mexico 28. Uh, and let's look at um, what this BMETS package can do. So I'm going to take my file but then I will copy from this file into a new program. That we do together because I will need to change quite a lot of things. Okay, now the BMS package has this syntax uh, and you start by creating a model using a text file, basically. So uh, you specify the name of the model uh, and uh, 
the syntax for the model is the following. For the identities, you want to have, you may want to have a comment, then uh, this identity followed by the greater than sign and the name of the variable that is uh, endogenous in the identity. And then uh, EQ followed by the identity. So it's not so different from what we had in here. In here, we had this append identity, blah, blah, blah. This is simply separated in different places. So uh, let's copy this simply to our new code. This is Mexico model, right? Because we have Mexico model and Mexico model two. This is Mexico model. Mexico model. Okay, I think I. Uh, had the equations up to VW in here. Yes, VW was the last one. So let me copy this to our new program. And uh, I'll call this new file Mexico 29. and save it in our shared folder. Okay, so I have additional identities and equations, but we will discuss them later. So uh, in the end, you have this end, which closes the definition of the model. Then uh, you have you can load the model uh, in BMETs, and this is the first thing which will provide some checking. Uh, so, okay, this uh, is gives me an error because I think I have to. Um, Uh, actually, I think I cannot run this after the program which reads the data. So uh, what I'm going to do is to cut everything out from here and go to our previous file and paste everything in here. And I will save this as Mexico 29. Okay. Uh, okay, now I don't know why this is still a mistake because this should be loading BMETs. Can you please put your cursor on the, on the X, on the red X of the mistake because it might give you an end I think it was just the column that should not, not have been there. I don't know why it doesn't give me an error here, but I don't think there is any need for this column. Okay, so uh, let's see whether this works. Okay, so it tells you that we have 31 identities, zero behaviorals, zero coefficients to analyze. Uh, then you have some uh, information that uh, you can obtain on the model. And maybe it's a little easier to Sorry, yes. 
Um, what did you do? Because I have I run the script and I have um, three behavioral thirty nine identities and ten suspicions. So you you did something that I lost probably. So this was I stopped copying the code. Uh, uh, this equation VW. So you must have copied all of the yes, model. Yes. Yeah, yeah. So it's not a problem, but. Um, okay. Okay. So uh, let's go back to EViews and to the model object. Now, there are a number of other important things that you want to know. So the first thing is, uh, how does the, uh, <clears throat> the model solve the equations? And are the equations recursive or simultaneous? Now, when you only have identities, the model is uh, recursive. You cannot have uh, in uh, accounting identities that one variable is determining another and the, the same happens on the other way around. If you <clears throat> choose in the model object view block structure, you have this list. And uh, basically this is telling you what Eviews has done to uh, prepare the model for simulation. So what Evius has done is trying to make the um, model recursive in a clever way so that the first equation to be solved is an equation which only depends on exogenous variables. Uh, and then the second equation will depend on the first one plus uh, the exogenous variables and so on. And uh, this is called triangularization of the matrix of the coefficients of the model. And I prepared a set of slides to discuss this, which is a, a, a very important point in uh, understanding models, but we can do this a little later. So you have the uh, sequence in which the model will be solved is the given by these lines. The other thing you can do here is uh, to go to the variables and uh, start from px. Uh, for each variable, you can look at the dependencies. The dependencies are the variables that determine what we are looking at, so uh, in this case, P uh, X is uh, re the result, P X is the demand at current prices, the result of the deflator plus the demand at constant prices, which are both exogenous. And the dependencies going up will give you the, uh, the, uh, links between cause and effects in the model. So PXK influences PX and GDPK. And I can uh, keep going. So PX will impact GDP and NAFA P. NAFA P will impact the stock of wealth, VP, and so on. VP, I think, does not impact anything at this stage, okay? Uh, so these are useful ways to navigate through the model. In recent version of eViews, you also have the dependency graph. And the dependency graph uh, will have at the core the variables like GDP, which are determined by everything else and in the external area, the exogenous variables. So for simple models, this can be useful to track the link across variables. For complicated models, it becomes very messy. In BMETs, I must say, uh, 
that I've worked with BMETs only to prepare for this course, so I'm no expert on BMETs. Uh, but you also have some similar uh, specifications. So uh, this is uh, uh, what you can ask for an identity and it will give you a number of, of uh, values uh, which I guess you can change in other equations. So you can use an if command in an equation, for instance, uh, and uh, gives, lists the component of the equation and so on. Uh, this vsim, Okay, so the vpre is uh, the same thing we have done here with view block structure. So it's listing the sequence in which uh, the model will be solved. Now, they're not necessarily the same because we have many variables that depend only on exogenous and they can all be solved at the beginning, but this is with the given structure of the model, how, in which sequence the equations will be solved. Uh, I don't think we need this for the time being. So this is the, uh, this is how in R we create the model. Uh, we've seen how to load the model. The next step is going to be a little messy and it is to uh, attribute values to the model. So here, I don't know that whether this is going to work. Uh, and I've pre I prepared this but I fear that it will contain also variables that are not yet into the model. So let me copy this in here. And here now we no longer have uh, data as our data frame, but uh, what we call MD, I think. MD. So we want to replace sorry, replace all the occurrences of data dollar with MD dollar. And here I also specified that this will be time series starting at a given period with a quarterly frequency. So let's see whether this now works. Worked. So since it worked, it should also give me the possibility of solving the model. Now, uh, we don't have parameters so far. What we need to do is to load the data into the model is the next thing to do. Okay, I have a number of warnings that there are missing values here and there because we are missing the four the first four observations for some variables, but this is, should not be a problem. I don't know why I have this column here. I don't need to estimate coefficients. So I think I can move directly to the simulation.
Now, uh, how does the simulation work? Uh, the simulation starts from, uh, sorry, I wanted to scroll this window. Yes, starts from the first equation in the first period and computes the solution. Then moves to the second equation in the first period, finds the solution and so on. And we can have uh, two types of simulation. We can have a static simulation. In the static simulation, the software always uses the uh, historical value to find a solution. So uh, if we have, uh, as we have that, the interest payments in a period depend on the stock of, let's say, bonds in the previous period, and the stock of bonds is simulated by the model. In a static simulation, the solution will be based on the real historical value, while in a dynamic simulation, it will use the simulated result from the previous period. I don't know whether this is clear. So the difference uh, basically, uh, if uh, my equation says that yt is equal to uh, ct plus uh, i at period t minus one, okay, in a, let's say that uh, i star C, C star and I star are the simulated values. So in a static simulation, my Y star P will be given by a C star, sorry, it's by C T without the star plus I T minus one. While in the dynamic simulation, the Y star T will depend on the simulated C, if C has an equation, plus the simulated I at period T minus one. Now, what is the difference? The difference is that uh, when we simulate and we have a random component, we are estimating something, we will have an error. So the simulated value will differ from the historical value. So in the static simulation, we will not have these errors affecting the next period solutions. And the simulation will be closer to the real data, to the actual data. But if we want to forecast the future, uh, we do not have real data for the future. So we only we can only use a dynamic simulation if we want to estimate something for the future where I star, sorry, where C star will not be available. Okay. So uh, if you use as uh, this uh, possibility and you get it when you click on solve, you have dynamic and static and also fit, which uh, I don't, I've never used in my life. And uh, uh, also BMETs as these uh, forecast or static. So they should be um, equivalent to dynamic or static in EVUs. And the other important thing is the uh, range at for which you have a simulation. So here is 2009. We have data up to 2004, but uh, let's see what happens in EVUs. In EVUs now, the current sample is 2008 quarter two to 2021 quarter three. So if I click here on solve, this is what 
I will get. And we do have values for all these variables from 2008. So let's try the same in BMETs. So from 2008 to 2021, So it's saying that YD has a missing value. It's no convergence to be achieved is correct because we don't have any uh, feedbacks, but uh, I'm a little lost on why I have this error. Now, in BMETs, we have created this uh, MSFC model. And uh, the model data is the corresponding data set that the uh, BMETs is using. So uh, again, here we have similar information like the one we have in eViews. So in MSFC model, I can uh, ask for the identities. I can ask for, for the exogenous variables and I'll get a list of the exogenous. I can ask for the endogenous variable. Uh, the endogenous identities and so on. And in model data, I should be able to uh, look at the variables. So uh, YD starts in the second quarter of 2008 and uh, uh, ends third quarter of 2021. So it's not entirely clear to me why we had an error here starting in the second quarter. Let's try the third quarter. Okay, so it worked. And uh, uh, now I have the results uh, in my simulated In my simulations. So I can look at uh, GDPK. And if I want to uh, check whether this is uh, exactly identical to the historical GDP, I can, for instance, create a variable. So I hope it's okay if I write check uh, this one less MD dollar GDPK. Uh, no, because this is not a time series. So what I need to do is to use uh, the time series I've created for the model. and the check gives zero, so the GDP is identical to the simulation. Uh, and hopefully Alessandro will uh, teach us how to have the equivalent of my loop, the loop I showed you before, for having this check for all the endogenous variables without doing this uh, operation uh, one variable at a time. But yeah, I think we can, for the time being, copy this to the program. I think the best way to create um, a function that does exactly line 395, and then apply the function with the supply function to the whole 
a data frame where we are starting with. But this, I have to check it first, but I have a rough idea of the video. Yeah, the problem is that, um, as far as I understand, this MSFC model data is not a data frame, but is a list. And the same for these MSFC model simulations. So they are not variables in a data frame that you can take and compare to others, but you have to call them in this way. No, no, you can. You just know how to extract an element from the list. It's exactly the same. A list mm -hmm. data is more powerful than a data frame because the data frame can store only objects of the same size or maybe numeric and category. Mm -hmm. A data frame can store data frames, lists, inside lists, uh, many more, it's more flexible, it's multi dimensional object. Mm -hmm. And as long as you know how to pick up the element that you want in this multi dimensional stuff, you can do mm -hmm. sort of operation. Okay. Okay, so uh, this is the st step we wanted to make to be sure that we have no errors in the accounting. And now we need to move to the uh, modeling the behavior. So <clears throat> I'll I've done very simple assumptions for preparing these classes. And uh, remember, we want to have um, an explanation of the demand for all these stocks in the model and uh, for private expenditure in imports. And uh, um, we want to keep things simple. So uh, starting from the foreign assets, uh, we have in our balance sheet that these are demanded by the, uh, both the government and uh, the private sector. Uh, so what I have assumed here is that the foreign assets are the residual variable in the balance sheet of the rest of the world. So uh, remember, I don't, know, I don't know whether you remember the balance sheet, maybe I can put it on my slide. I think it was in slide number two. No, it's be slide number three or four. Yes, so <clears throat> basically, uh, VW, the net wealth of the foreign sector or the net wealth of the country is determined by the current account balance. Then we have a demand for equities from the rest of the world and a demand for domestic bonds from the rest of the world. So what I've assumed is that the demand for equities uh, and the demand for bonds are given, the demand for bonds from the rest of the world can be considered to be the clearing of the market. So whatever is not demanded by the private sector will be bought by the foreign sector. Uh, the demand for equities from abroad can be taken as an exogenous variable because it depends on the confidence of the foreign investors in the country. So for a given change in BW, EW, and uh, VW being determined by the balance of payment, then the uh, FL is uh, determined residually, okay? Is what we call the buffer stock for uh, this sector. And this is what I've done for the foreign sector. Now, uh, still to keep things simple, I've assumed that the government bonds, uh, that the, in the balance sheet of the government, the demand for equities and the demand for foreign assets are policy variable that are exogenous. So it's a decision of the government if they're not 
to be explained by an, by an equation. And therefore, the deficit or surplus will fix Vg for given values of Eg and Fg, we can determine the stock of bonds that will be the supply of new bonds. Uh, equities, uh, it's always complicated to know how equities uh, are supplied. So what you usually do is to look at this over some reference variable. So in the model, the stock of equities is E <clears throat> measured at historical prices. So we can look at the change in E over let's say GDP. And basically this is telling us, uh, this is seasonal because GDP is seasonal. If I want to remove seasonality, I can take the moving average of this ratio over four quarters. So this is saying that roughly there's been an increase in the stock of equities in, of about 2% of GDP. So assuming that this is the policy that of companies in Mexico to issue equities in a rather stable ratio to the cycle is a reasonable assumption without the need to do an econometric estimate. So let's see what I've done to do this. And this is what uh, how my assumptions are translated into accounting identities. So this is the foreign assets. As I told you, this is determined by the balance of payments. BW and DW will uh, be given later and F is the buffer stock. BW, the stock of bonds bought by the foreigners is the difference between the stock of bonds issued and the stock of bonds bought by the private sector. And the same for the equities market. The, equi the foreign sector is the residual buyer of equities. The government is issuing bonds uh, to balance the balance sheet and uh, the equities the government buys change with this DEG variable, which will be exogenous. And the foreign assets the government buys will change with this DFG variable, which is exogenous. Equities will increase with this DE variable, which we uh, can model as a function of GDP through this parameter that I call par DE. Uh, finally, the foreign assets held by the private sector uh, will be the variable, the buffer stock in the balance sheet of the private sector. So for a given uh, total wealth determined by net lending and given supply of equities determined in the lines above and the given demand for bonds, then uh, this will be the buffer stock for the uh, private sector. So this is how I have so far endogenized the, the financial variables. The only thing which needs to be endogenized yet is the uh, stock of bonds bought by the private sector. Okay, so let's just uh, uh, complete this in R because you will remember that I copied only part of the model into R. So I stopped at the equation for VW and I need to now add all these additional identities
into our code. And I think uh, everything else should still work. So we will need to create the model again because the model has changed. Okay, so my check variable is still zero. So the additional identities have not given any trouble. So now we, where are we? Okay, now we need to endogenize the other variables by some estimation. And the variables we will still need to endogenize are, let me, um, Gonna run everything again. So now we have forty equations, and uh, uh, we still have to endogenize BP. I can also sort the variables by type to have all the exogenous endogenous listed together. So we have BP, the stock of bonds demanded by the private sector, which is still exogenous, but this should be endogenous. Uh, these are policy variables. Imports are still exogenous and should be determined through an equation. Uh, PPX, the price level, uh, we can keep it exogenous for the time being, but we should think about it later. PXK is the private expenditure at constant prices, and we need to endogenize this. RB, RF, these are interest rates, and we can keep them exogenous for the time being. The relative prices will also be exogenous for the time being. And uh, uh, exports also will be kept exogenous. So now we need to estimate. Uh, and uh, the way in which we do our estimation is, uh, as I usually say, quite pragmatic. So I don't know how far I've gone into econometrics, but basically, uh, you know, the econometrics of time series is now uh, very much into VARs, and uh, VARs have a different philosophy from the structural models we are using here. So the uh, structural VARs tend to become similar to these models, but in a much more complicated way. Uh, and for single equations, if you don't want to use VARs, uh, the idea is to use cointegration techniques if uh, your variables are non-stationary, uh, which is usually the case. And cointegration techniques, again, uh, are different. They can be based on VARs or they can be based on single equation estimation. Uh, I don't know how often you have tried to do these estimates, but usually if you estimate the same link among the same variables with different methods, you get different parameters. Sometimes one method tells you that the variables are co-integrated and you're happy. The other method tells, tells you they're not. So 
uh, it's really a pain. And uh, uh, what Godley used to do is to use very simple OLS estimates, which most of the time proved to be reasonable. And uh, uh, then you tell me, look, uh, I know that this is not palatable to our colleagues to have a simple OLS. So check with modern econometric techniques what you can get. But uh, what I want are parameters which are as reasonable as the one I get from the, my OLS. And from this point of view, having a stock flow model is very useful because uh, when you put an estimated equation into the model, uh, you will immediately see whether the parameters that you have used are such that the model goes in a completely wrong direction or not. So you have an additional check of the robustness of your estimation of your results that is given by the uh, coherence between your estimates and the overall model properties. So we will try to see this uh, next, but I would like to have a break before we continue. And uh, then we will move to these estimates, okay? <clears throat> 15 minutes. And then preparing the model for making projections. And after that, we have finished and we can uh, uh, discuss and work on how to extend the model to additional, to, to endogenize additional features. I think it's because um, in the additional variables section, you have to write in small because in the end data set, you choose with the small, but in the additional variables, you try to build it on GNP. Ah, maybe you didn't update the Excel file because yesterday you it's about it's okay, yeah, Excel file. yeah, exactly um, because you change this in the Excel file and not in the code. But yesterday, okay. I found that in the evening, the, the function to change to uppercase letter. So let me copy the GDP OECD. Okay, now it has been updated. Yes, that was the other problem, the lowercase letters. Okay, so
Okay. Okay, so we want to now estimate our behavioral equations. And uh, there are three variables which uh, we really need to endogenize, which are the demand for bonds from the private sector, the uh, private sector demand, and the imports. So let's start from the demand for bonds and uh, uh, the what we usually do in uh, the stock flow consistent approach is to look at the share of these bonds in uh, the uh, portfolio. So here I've taken the uh, uh, VP, which is the uh, net financial assets. E are the liabilities of the private sector. So VP plus E are the total as assets of the private sector and BP is the share on total assets and it's declining over time. And uh, the Tobin approach suggests that this should depend on the interest rate on bonds. If this goes up, this should go up. Uh, the other asset we have are foreign assets. So if the interest rate on foreign assets increases the share of bonds in the portfolio should be reduced. So we can estimate a simple equation. Uh, we don't want to do anything too complicated. In EVUs, I can use the menus and estimate uh, this ratio against the difference between the RB, which is the interest rate on bonds, and RF, which is the interest rate on foreign assets, plus a constant. Uh, I have to check the sample period seems to be correct. <clears throat> and uh, uh, I have uh, this estimate, which is uh, OK from the point of view of the science because I expect the share to increase with RB increases over RF. So the sign is okay. We, sorry, you want to do the standard uh, battery of tests for your results. So it's obvious here that the, the diving Watson is too low. So there is a autocorrelation here. And we are only explaining a small share of these trending variables. So in principle, we would want to do the analysis of stationarity, check whether uh, the series is stationary or not. The explanatory variable we are using uh, seems to be stationary at first sight. So we are trying to explain a non-stationary series with a stationary series, which is usually not an excellent idea. So the standard simpler solution is to add the lagged dependent variable to the, uh, as a, ex, an additional explanatory variable. And in eViews, uh, this is achieved by adding uh, brackets minus one after the variable names. And so I get, a, as expected, a very high coefficient. And uh, uh, I still have the positive significant parameter here for the interest rates. The Darby Watson now is no longer a problem. And what you usually want to do in with this estimation, first of all, is to check uh, how well you are fitting the data. And uh, uh, we are missing completely the uh, great recession shock in here. But after that, the uh, error in our estimate is reasonably small. It looks like uh, it is seasonal. So this may suggest to add an additional seasonal determinant to the uh, estimate. 
I don't know how familiar you are with this type of analysis. We can look at the correlogram of the residuals. Now, if the residuals are seasonal, we should have the, the fourth autocorrelation, the eighth autocorrelation, the third autocorrelation are large, but this is apparently not the case. None of the uh, autocorrelation uh, parameters are significant. So, we could be happy with this equation. And uh, uh, what you do in eViews is to uh, copy the code corresponding to your estimate and uh, put it into your model now using the merge. So you define an object, which is called, in this case, EQBP, and then you merge the object into your model to add it uh, to the model. How do we do this in BMETs? And uh, uh, slightly more elaborate. So let me copy this from my previous program. Uh, for estimated equation, you need to have behavioral instead of identity followed by the variable you want to estimate. Now, I was not sure that I could specify the endogenous variable in an implicit form, because here I have BP over VP plus E. So uh, I created a new variable called BPR, which is exactly equal to BP over VP plus E, and use BPR as my endogenous variable. Uh, in BMETs, the function TS lag will take the first leg and uh, the other variable will be RB minus RF. And then you have to specify a list of the parameters that are present in the equation. Uh, so this is how you estimate the equation using uh, BMETs. I think if you want to estimate it with uh, uh, something else, uh, I think we can use uh, uh, what was the the package you gave me for dy um, dy lmm but i've not loaded it here uh, dy lmm nlm and LM. Okay. Okay. So with this dy, I can use. Uh, uh, first of all, let me check that I have my uh, BPR variable in place. Mm. Ah, sorry, I'm in the wrong program. Okay. I think I need to run everything again. In the environment, there is no MSFT model data. Yeah, I'm running everything again. Okay. Yeah. Uh, no, I don't have PPR. So there are additional lines of code that I needed to copy because I copied 
yeah, I copied this uh, variable here, but I didn't copy these additional variables. Uh, so this BPR is uh, doing the same calculation I've done in eViews. Then I also wanted to create a time trend uh, and this is how you can do it in R. So let me copy this code to Mexico 29 in the appropriate place. And the appropriate place would be after I've created model data. So again, I'm selecting everything, running everything. Now I should have my model data BPR. So I can use uh, uh, LM now to do uh, an estimate, right? NLM. DYNLM. And this should be uh, BPR. Sorry. MSFC model data BPR. Uh, against now the the I need the tilde. Yeah. Uh, huh? The my keyboard is alt R plus. The my keyboard is not. Okay. Yeah, what I do the first time is to copied from Word. Let's check whether I have it here somewhere. But I don't think so. No. In which button do you have the tilde? No, I don't have the tilde in my keyboard anywhere. So what I do is I insert a symbol And then I copy this here. Okay. And now I have a list of the explanatory variables. And what was the uh, dy and lm for the lag? I think it's just lag. Lag? No, it's L, capital L. But lag seems to be working. It gives me the the. Oh, it's picking up from a different package. Then. Oh, okay. So, lag with the. No, it's more case letter. Hmm? It's more case letter. Okay, lag. And then uh, should be BPR well MSFC model data BPR. And then I guess comma one. Yeah. Then I have plus, right? Mm -hmm. And the variables were um, uh, MSFC model data RB minus MSFC model data RF. And I guess it will include a constant by itself. But let's see. Error in lag. It's L. It's capital L. Hmm? It's capital L instead of the word lag. Yeah, it's capital L. Okay. And with a one, comma one for the last one. Right. It looks like it worked. Yeah. So let's check whether we have the same results. It looks to me they are the same. So it's in 0, 9, 6, or Yeah. For the like variable. 
0.0095. Yes, I don't know why. <clears throat> Nine six two. They're not exactly the same. Here it's only giving me model data RB, doesn't give me the difference with RF. So maybe it's not doing the calculation. Uh, I think it doesn't understand that there's a calculation is happening. Yeah, you should go, you should create a new variable like that. Uh, but I'm pretty sure that, uh, anyway, let's look at BIMETs. So I was showing you how to code the estimation in BIMETs. And this is where my original file. So I'm going to copy these lines into the new Mexico 29. And uh, uh, I'm pretty sure that in BMETs this will work. So let's forget about LM and uh, I estimate everything again. Yes, now I've done something stupid because I need to estimate the model before simulating. And the code for estimating the model is this one that I should put up after the, I have loaded the model data. And before we simulate, okay. Okay, so now okay, I have lost what you, what you did just now. So what I've done is to uh, copy. Where is my model? I think I deleted everything. No, this is these are the definition of the variables. This is the model coded in BMETs. And here I've added these lines for the estimate of BPR. And here it looks like it uh, accepted RB less RF in the coding. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so I've loaded the model, then this is the definition of the variables. Uh, then uh, I've created these additional variables, loaded the variables into the model, and then I've added this line for estimating the parameters uh, in the model. This will estimate all the parameters that are present in the model, and this will give me the outcome, and this is the estimate I get for a BPR, which looks similar, actually identical to what I have in eViews. Okay. So this is how we include an estimated equation. Uh, let's estimate the other equations that we want to endogenize. So the next one was the private expenditure. And uh, this, is, this is the core equation uh, because 
if we determine GDP, and I think this is what I've done here, yes. So the standard simpler, I cannot enlarge this, I'm afraid. The standard uh, equation for private expenditure in a stock flow model is such that uh, it implies uh, convergence to a stable stock of assets relative to income. And uh, this implies that you want the private expenditure to be a function of real disposable income. And here, nominal disposable income divided by the price index and the opening stock of wealth uh, divided by the uh, price index. Now, this is not working for Mexico because uh, we want this coefficient to be positive in order to have a positive stock of net assets over, over income as the outcome. So uh, we will need to investigate why this is not working. And uh, we can look at the uh, residuals and we see that uh, what is uh, uh, driving our result is uh, the COVID crisis. In the COVID crisis, we have a very large residual for our equation. And there also, there are also something which is not well specified because our residuals are slowly going up in a, this first part of the sample, then going down. So they are very far from being normally distributed around zero. So we want to improve on this equation. Now, the simplest way in which you can improve, uh, and don't use this here, is if you don't want to, I mean, if you have no time to uh, do appropriate research and you only want to present this to a class, is to get rid of your outliers, the outliers given by the, the COVID prices. Uh, and one way to do that is to use a dummy variable. So a dummy variable, you know what, what it is. And uh, the residual, the largest residual we have in here, uh, I can, yes. So it's in the third quarter of 2020. The COVID crisis usually starts in the second quarter of 2020. So uh, in EVUs, we can do that by adding a variable called at is period followed by the uh, quarter in which we want to have the, um, the dummy placed. So this is significant, but I don't think it has solved our problem completely. And indeed, we still have a very large residual in the next quarter. So let's try to take out both quarters from our regressions and adding another one for the fourth quarter of 2020. And now look at the magic and we now have a positive coefficients here, even if it's not statistically significant, okay? So once we have taken out the uh, extreme uh, events, the significance of our variables can change dramatically. Uh, so let's check whether we can further improve. Uh, it looks like the, there is some type of autocorrelation and seasonality in here. So the other thing we may want to try is uh, to have, and this is what I've done in my uh, in the program I distributed, is uh, uh, not to use the previous value for the stocks, but to use the value of the previous year for the stocks. So if uh, we have this seasonality, 
it makes sense to use uh, the opening stock of wealth in the same quarter of the previous year rather than in the previous quarter. So in this case, we would want to lag the stock by four instead of lagging it only once. And uh, we can drop these uh, dummies to begin with and see what happens. Now, we already have a better outcome because now without dummies, the coefficient here is positive, although it's not significant. And uh, uh, if we want to eliminate this uh, COVID crisis, we will want to have the dummies. And now uh, the coefficient is uh, not significant, but the p-value is 12%. So it's getting closer to being significant. And its value is reasonable. Usually what we uh, expect to find for the propensity to consume out of income is a value between 0 0.5 and 0 0.8. And what we want to find for the coefficient of wealth is uh, between 0, 0, 0.02 and 0, 0, 0.06. So the value here is reasonable. Now, obviously we can try to do much better with the equation, but let's use this one uh, for our exercise. Maybe we will try to improve it later on. So, uh, if we want to use this in R, let's see what else we need to do. So uh, I already did some work on this. And this is my private sector demand, which was not using the dummies. Uh, so I will want to copy this from here to Mexico 29. And notice that I had to change the estimation range because uh, since I'm using four legs of wealth, now I'm losing the observation for 2008 and the the estimate must start from 2009 first quarter, which is exactly what I have in here. Now, how to do dummies? Uh, I have not introduced the dummies in the code, but I looked at how to do dummies and uh, let's see whether this works. So, what I need to do if I want to use the dummies is to add them as the additional variables that I compute in here. I want one for 2023rd quarter. And I need to copy this as a time series Uh, I don't know why it starts in 1995. So my data start in 2007. So this can start, sorry, wait. 2007. So let's use 2007. Frequency equal four. Let's see whether this works. No. Uh, I think that I no longer have this code in that code. I no longer have data.
uh, they do have my trend. So So I think I can use this uh, 2020 quarter three would be 55. So I want to have uh, MD. No, is MSFC model data dollar trend. Uh, and I want this to be equal to 55. So I need to, I, don't, I think I don't need to use grep anymore, right? You just want to create a variable that takes a value one when a specific yes. quarter is met, right? And then zero otherwise. So it's if so this is the it's like binding stuff together so i don't know what you really need there right it's like creating a string hmm? i don't i don't get the, the original meaning of the variable grapple what you wanted to do with that grapple was looking for a uh an alphanumeric value okay I but now i want I simply to have zero if trend is different from 55 one if it, then do like that if else instead of if else and if the dollar sign trend um equal equal 55 comma one comma zero okay okay so i also want the dummy for the next period i think 2024 q4 Match the yeah. So now it'll be fifty six. Okay, and now I've defined these variables and I can use them into my estimate in limits. So I need to add. Uh, parameters p x k three times d q three plus fourth parameter and I need to add these to the list of parameters to be estimated. Okay, so let's see if everything works. Okay, now didn't work. And uh, I have a question. When you define this dummy variable, mm -hmm. uh, can show sure again exactly here? Okay, you define them first and then you append them. Then I transform them into a time series. You append them to the data. Yes. So they should be here. Okay. No, uh, this error made me mad uh, until uh, one of my colleagues solved it. 
And uh, uh, the trouble is, let me check the... Hmm? No, the, the problem, I, I saw this problem by adding this uh, uh, here, but now it's no longer working. And basically what is happening is that uh, BMATS has a procedure to check if uh, the explanatory variables are collinear. So uh, the procedure is such to um, have a, a tolerance value. And in this message here, it uh, gives me the reciprocal condition number. So we extended this in order to try to fix the problem, but now it's not working anymore. I don't know whether by making this larger or smaller. Yes. Now I made it smaller and uh, it did find uh, a solution because it decided that the matrix of the of explanatory is not collinear. But this was like some sort of dummy trap because of the dummies? Right? No, it was, had nothing to do with the dummies. I, it was really mysterious. I also wrote to the authors of the package. Let's see if the coefficients are the same we have in uh, eViews. So this would be 0 0.807. It's exactly the same outcome we have from eViews. So we are happy. Uh, last variable we wanted to endogenize are imports for the time being. And imports are, are usually given by uh, uh, a domestic demand term and uh, a relative price. So this is the price of imports divided by the domestic price index. So this equation has reasonable values. It has in logs, so these are elasticities and uh, it has a, a, an income elasticity of 1.4, which is high, but it's reasonable for Mexico, I would think. Uh, a positive linear time trend, which I don't like, but it's how well, we fixed the problem of the estimate. And the relative price is an elasticity of minus 0.3, which is a little low, but also not too bad. We can check the residuals <clears throat> and see whether we can try to improve the estimate. Now, this is not using any lag dependent variable. We are missing the crisis of 2009 of the Great Recession. But overall, this is not so bad. Maybe we would like to have a seasonal term to improve uh, the estimate, but basically, what this is saying is that the seasonality of demand is matching the seasonality of imports. Uh, the Darwin Watson is low. <clears throat> and yes, this is suggesting that we should have a, both a seasonal lag and a simple lag to improve the estimate. So if we want to do that, uh, we can try adding the uh, first lag of imports and the fourth lag of imports, but they are not significant. Uh, if I add them in this way, they don't solve the problem. So I su would suggest to keep this equation, the simple equation, as it is now, uh, there is a problem with this equation and the previous equation of endogeneity of regressors. Okay, and don't know whether you're familiar with this problem, but we will 
discuss it uh, later today as well, which is that uh, it is likely that domestic demand will depend on imports. So th th these are not, as we say, weakly exogenous. And if this is the case, then uh, the estimates can be biased. And this is even worse for our equation for uh, uh, private sector demand. Because in this case, uh, it's obvious that the disposable income in real terms will depend on expenditure, on private expenditure through the standard Keynesian multiplier. So the higher the current expenditure, the higher the wages and profits, the higher disposable income. So you have a problem of endogeneity. Uh, and uh, if you want to publish anything uh, with uh, this type of approach, you have to address this very carefully because this was one of the uh, cores of the Lucas critique. So the Lucas critique said you have these structural change in models and you uh, ignore the problem of endogeneity and therefore uh, your estimates may be wrong, especially if uh, agents react to policy announcement, blah, blah, blah. So you cannot publish this equation without a discussion on the endogeneity of YD against PKX. So what we do is usually either to use a, a, an instrumental variable method for estimation. And uh, uh, I will not go into the details, but the instrumental variable estimation is estimating YD against uh, exogenous variables and using the outcome in place of YD in the estimate so that the new variable is weakly exogenous with respect to PXK, or uh, we run some type of VAR analysis uh, or co-integrating analysis in order to be sure that there is no feedback from PXK to YD in the final model. So these are the two strategies that you usually adopt to overcome the problem. Uh, there is another issue that I've never had the, the ability to discuss properly, which is uh, that uh, in most people prefer to use logs when doing estimates with time series. And this is because uh, if you use logs, the parameters are elasticities and they're easier to interpret. And uh, the change in logs are growth rates. So uh, if you have a, an error correction specification, it will uh, be easy to understand. But Gottlieb didn't like uh, this approach for this specific equation because uh, it would not imply, as in the SIM model in Gottlieb Lavoie, a very neat stock to flow ratio as the outcome. So if you use this equation, and the parameters are at the correct sign and reasonable values, then the stock flow ratio of the total net wealth of the private sector relative to income will give you a value which you can compare to the actual values and see whether the economy is converging toward this value or diverging. If you use the logs, this becomes more complicated so in all DV models, we try to use this equation in levels rather than in logs or using error correction or co-integration. While in other equations, we don't really care. Uh, so this, this is just to say that this equation should be treated with care because it's potentially misestimated. So uh, the other equation was for this for imports. And we have seen that we can be reasonably happy with what we have. 
So again, let's uh, take the code that I already wrote in BMETS and I'm copying this to Mexico 29. Uh, and I think I don't need to do anything else. So uh, we should now be able to run the model. So I'm running everything up to here. and then uh, estimate the coefficients. The estimates are also okay. So now we have all the variables we wanted to endogenize. Have been endogenized. So let me run everything again also in uh, eViews. Don't know where this stops. <laughs> yes, should be okay. Okay. So what we want to do next is to simulate the whole model in a dynamic form and compare the outcome with the actual data. So I've done this in uh, eViews by using solve. And uh, uh, I have written this code, which is creating a chart for all endogenous variables uh, simulated against history. And then uh, I have this uh, possibility of uh, merging charts together. And I can look at this one at a time. So this is the stock of bonds. And here the blue lines will be the historical values and the orange, the simulated values. And here I have a, a feel immediately of where I'm tracking the data and where I'm not tracking the data. So these are this is the bonds bought by the private sector. This is the bonds bought by the rest of the world. Uh, these are basically almost exogenous. These are taxes. Uh, this is... Uh, the stock of foreign assets. Uh, this is the stock of foreign assets bought by the private sector. This is my GDP at current prices and GDP at constant prices. And uh, the simulation looks pretty good. Uh, where I think we, now this is something that you get always in stock flow models. The interest payments, uh, depend on the stock of, of underlying assets. So if the stock is not tracking the history, the interest payments would not track the history and the income, which depend on the interest payment will diverge from history. And these are usually difficult to model. What you, these are imports at current and constant prices. What you want to be very careful about are the net lending. So this is the net lending of the government. This is the net lending of the private sector. And this is where most of our problems rely right now because we are missing something in uh, around 2015, 16. And we are missing a lot in 2020 with the crisis. So this is where the model is diverging dramatically from history. And uh, this is mirrored in the error we make in the balance of payment. 
is a very large error in the balance of payment. And this translates into a large error in the stocks that are the accumulation of the balance of payment. So this is uh, what you do to check how you are doing. Uh, and uh, yes, this is the uh, stock of foreign assets. And given the error in the balance of payment, the error accumulates and makes the equation, the value diverge too much from, from history. And now we're starting the loop again. So this is it. So how do we do this in uh, uh, BIMETs? Uh, we did this estimate. Now we want to do a simulation and we want to do the simulation over, sorry, over the sample that for which we have everything, which is 2009 quarter one. So we want to adjust this to be starting in 2009. And let's hope that uh, this will work. It worked. Okay, so now we have all the outcome in uh, the uh, MSFC model simulation. So we can do a similar analysis. Uh, now we don't want to check because now we do not expect this to match exactly the, the data. We want to, let's say, plot uh, MSFC model data uh, GDP state NAFA W. Uh, and hopefully this will give me a plot. It does, but I need to enlarge my window. Okay. And now I think I can add MSFC model simulation, uh, the same variable NAFA W, maybe add a color, call is the color? Yeah. No. And then in quotation mark, if you type the color in red. Call. Equal, no, color equal, quotation mark, red. You sure? Yeah. OK, so this is how you create similar charts in uh, R for the data against your simulation. So if I do the same for... If you want, we can do it with this packet for plot. I, I can tell you the thing. Okay. Because we can hover over the line and see the value direction. So first you have to install the package for plot. We have to... It takes just a matter of seconds. So it will be... Plot. 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 So you don't have it, so you have to import it first. Okay, so let's install. You can also install, and then search for plot. Yeah, exactly. This is a bit large type package, so it takes a couple of seconds to install. Mm -hmm. And it depends on the number of other packages. It on the of the this is kind of creating mini websites. The picture is not the picture, it's like a mini website. I see. In HTML. Yeah. So now I've loaded it. Yeah, now we can create uh, basically the same plot that we did before with you. So you type um, uh, plot underscore ly, open mm -hmm. parentheses and close parentheses. Goes immediately. Then the pipe operator, as we did yesterday, so percent larger than percent to a new line so that we have a clear structure of the plot. Add like ADB underscore trace. Uh. Open parentheses. 
and then we have to define the y and the x. So we need so the, we need a time variable. So the y is the what the I have here. One. Yes. We need the y, and the, but we have to say y equal in front of the variable. Equal. So y equal. A uh, y equal. Yes. Exactly. Like that. Then go to a new line maybe so that we separate the two variables. X equal. So now we need MSFC more than data dollar sign. And I think it was called quarter at the time. No, we don't have the quarter anymore. Can we have it anymore? No. <laughs> How many observations do we have? <laughs> Uh, How long is this object? Then we simply just. But it's new strand to begin with, and then yeah, we right. we yeah. do that later. Okay. And then comma to a new line. Type equal. Quotation mark scatter. Scatter. Yeah, S C A T R A T E. Yes. Why do you want to scatter? X, really? X code out its, it out its code this package. Then comma, new line, mode equal lines. It's oh, package. okay. Lines. Lines. And then maybe we can define the color also. So <clears throat> new line, it's not, it's um it's line equal equal list open parentheses. <clears throat> Um, I think it's color equal quotation mark red. It doesn't give me color. Anyway, color equal red. Maybe it's not color, it's color. I don't remember now. <coughs> there should be one of the four. That's color it. That's it. Now, do we add the other variable? Uh, we copy and paste it. <laughs> Change the variable. Copy and paste it. Paste. You have Basically, after the parentheses, another type operator. So we are chaining all these traces together. So uh, this plot L Y. So I need to copy from here. No, just the trace. Exactly from there. From right. here. Yeah, you're right. And put it after the parentheses. Yeah. yeah. And here, instead of model data and alpha W, we will have model simulation. Alpha dub. And here the color would be black, for example. for example. Let's see whether it works. <clears throat> okay, so there are different sides of X and Y. Because probably in, we have lost one observation in the Nafa W. Mm. So maybe we reduce the trend. We do after model data the assign trend. Uh, open square brackets minus one. Minus one. Um, minus one. Minus one. And can you try to just execute this x? MSCC model data trend minus one. No, no, just 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 uh, to show the data in the console. MSCC model data dollar sign. Uh, okay. One. Exactly. Just this little portion here. Right. Starting from here, so now we should have one less. Not sure that this is what we want. Because it, it, it's, a, it's a quick uh, fix. It's not a because it says that the error says that the column X has one element more, so we have to eliminate one more. Okay, it's not very elegant, but it should work. Let's try this. Okay, and then in the other one we have. Yeah, and then there are less. Yeah. So we should start this by dropping the first eight. Let's drop the first eight observations of this one. How do we drop the first eight observations? 
uh, with like square brackets minus a. Uh, only up in the two. Yeah, it's only up in this is one so colon minus c. Where is it? Yeah. Hmm? So from one to eight. Yeah, two. Otherwise, I'll be eight to one. Uh, <clears throat> let's check. So this starts 2007. So if I do this minus eight, it should, this should start in 2009. So I think this should be minus 12. Minus 12, I still have for missing because in this way you remove just the object number 12 you have to say from 1 to 12 one, so one 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 like this yeah <clears throat> all right uh probably so the c is missing minus c open parenthesis and then we'll oh, one yeah, now it looks hopefully correct. And what about model simulation? Now these are, we have 47 mm -hmm. model simulation dollar NAFA W. Uh, they are how many? To count the rows, I these are 48, these are 51. <clears throat> you can just type n row and then exactly n row open parenthesis, not just n, like the letter n. Open parenthesis and then the object that we were looking at. <clears throat> Okay, fine. Then let's start with the function length L E N exactly the point. Okay. Fifty one. Yeah. Uh. Well, this was smaller. <clears throat> so I think we can add another four here. Okay, so this looks okay to me. Okay. And so what we want to do here is but to- You know what, for the X, just say from one to 51 instead of using the trend because the trend is just a number so it doesn't really matter okay so one for <clears throat> let me fix this first so yeah. this should be model data should be minus c112 and this should be uh, Okay, this should be like this. And what about trend? The X, instead of uh, trying not to fix the trend, just type one colon 51. So that we know that it will be just, instead of the years, we have just this time frame from one to 51. And here should be exactly one to the last, uh, how, how long this, this model simulation after that. Let's try this. Mm -hmm. Y is 47, X is 51, Y is 47. Anyway, now this is suggesting that if you have 
47 may work. I think that there are two. I think that you have two different plans, right? Yes. But we, I thought we had fixed that. <clears throat> It was one to eight in the first instance. So we saw that this one, the simulation, length is 51. And what we have here, Forty-seven. Oh yes, so we have to add the drop on the eight. So now we should have everything to be fifty-one observations. Okay. Okay, and you said that this would give me the values. Yeah. And we can nice. name them if you want to be really a bit more fancy. Yeah, sure. And I guess you can move the legend elsewhere. The the okay, so this looks nice. So we can delete this and keep this uh, in the code. Okay, so uh, we've seen how to uh, check the model against the, um, the data and find where our model is not doing so well. And the next step would be try to improve the estimates. Uh, but we are not going to do that uh, right now. And uh, uh, what we want to do next, but I think after uh, lunch break is, uh, uh, okay, we assume that we have endogenized everything and uh, the, our model is satisfactory, we want to explore its properties. So we explore the properties by uh, doing a simulation and changing one parameter at a time and see what are the multipliers, the implied multipliers. And uh, the same exercise is, uh, can be done on the future. So I have to specify the path for all exogenous variables over my future period that I want to forecast and then simulate the model over these future periods. So we will do this uh, after the lunch break. So where, when are we coming back? It's uh, one o'clock now. One hour. One hour, okay. So I tell the people online. I think six thirty. Six thirty is Yeah, but we'll finish at one. Ah, so we did half an hour later to be begun to do and we had half an hour late. Uh -huh. So we just restart at um, half past two. Otherwise, it would be quite a long session. Yeah. Yeah. This is yeah. uh, start at two and then let's see when we, we continue. No, yeah, exactly. We yeah. Yeah. So we can the rest of it. Yeah, well, I still need breaks. I cannot yeah. stay here for four yeah. hours in a row. Yeah, okay. Yeah. 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 Yeah.